Yeah. All right, so uh, w welcome to the Toby Nomis Memorial Lecture. Um, sorry for the uh, delay, a few IT problems. Um, we've never actually run an event like this before. It's sort of, we've got obviously people in the room. We've also got about 200 people um, on Zoom. So just to get the uh, boring stuff out of the way, um, fire safety, the, there are no planned fire drills. If the alarm does sound, um, if you could make your, your way down the stairs as you come in and the muster points in the car park at the front of the building. Um, obviously, if you could turn your mobile phones off or set them to silent, that'd be most appreciated. Um, a question we get quite a bit uh, is on CPD certificates. Um, we will make CPD certificates available um, for, for those here or on, on, on Zoom, but in order for us to send them, you, you will have to complete the IET feedback form that will be um, sent out around in around a week's time. Um, so if you just click to say you've attended, we'll, we'll then email those out. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, um, th this, um, th this event sort of um, arranged by the Midlands Power Group uh, ultimately to um, commemorate the, um, um, the, 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 the sorry, the commemorate Toby Norris. Um, he was a founding member of the IET Midlands Power Group. Um, he worked for the uh, Central Electric Generating Board in their laboratories um, for a number of years, specialised in magnetism and um, superconductors, uh, and ultimately became a uh, professor of electrical engineering at um, Aston and, uh, sorry, professor of electrical and mechanical engineering at Aston University. Um, so we're joined here today by uh, John Evans. Uh, John is going to give us a talk on uh, electromagnetic compatibility of class 390 uh, Pendolino trains. Um, I'm sure if everyone's read John's bio, he's, he's had a bit of a fascinating career, um, worked all over the world. Um, yeah, and I, th I think uh, this is going to be a really interesting talk. So I'll, uh, I'll hand you over to, to John. Good evening to everybody here in the room and to all those who are joining at home. So yes, the subject of tonight's talk is the Class 390 Pendolino and how has the project's evolved over the last 25 years, um, all the issues we've had with electromagnetic compatibility. Uh, so just to give a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing. First of all, I'll just talk about the Class 390 project, um, the history of the project how we look to design the train uh, for compatibility with the infrastructure. The steps we took for validation and verification in the original build stages. And then we'll look at some of the issues that arose during that testing, uh, because it was quite a, quite a difficult test program. There were quite a few things came up that were unexpected. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll have a talk about some of the, the issues that arose. And then as the project developed, um, Later on, we, we had the project to introduce the additional cars, additional vehicles, uh, and, and what that meant then to changes to the, the EMC characteristics. And then how we've used the train to support uh, new electrification schemes and to ensure compatibility with, with new electrification, which might be slightly different than what we've had in the past. And then finally, a look at uh, some of the things we've been doing in the last few years. Um, as, a, as a whole industry approach to improving the performance of the overhead line equipment and using the trains to help monitor the performance of the overhead line. So with the uh, start off with the overview, um, the project was launched in May 1998. Uh, so next year I'll have been on, involved with the project for 25 years. So maybe I'll get a watch. <laughs> um, Originally, it was going to be 45 eight car trains uh, and eight nine car trains. Um, but it very quickly became apparent um, that that wasn't going to be enough capacity for what was it, the passenger growth on the West Coast main line. So, before the trains really entered uh, passenger service in any numbers, all 53 trains had been extended to nine car by the end of 2004. With the success of the service and the improved journey times, um, the, the trains were getting full, a lot of trains were full and standing. Um, so a decision was taken to, to add extra capacity. 
And as a result of that, there's 106 additional vehicles introduced in 2012. Now that number of 106 was meant to be two extra vehicles for each of the 53 trains. Um, but things became complicated because we actually lost one train in the accident at Greyrig, um, which needed to be replaced. Um, and as Alston said, the minimum order quantity for a new train set was, was four trains. So we ended up getting uh, four new trains, plus a reduced number of additional vehicles for the other trains to give the same total of 106. I think the DFT would support um, the investment, but we weren't allowed to have more train, more vehicles than we originally agreed. The trains are designed for a maximum speed of 140 miles an hour, um, and they operate in service at 125 miles an hour. When we did the original test program, we tested up to 140 miles an hour. I think, I think the high speed runs we did were up to 148, and that was between Nuneaton and Rugby, I think it was, in one of the test sites. Uh, if we ever get ETCS um, coming in as the uh, in cab signaling on, on the West Coast, there is still, I, I presume, the option to increase the speed to 140 miles an hour if there's a desire to, to do so. But I think with the, uh, with the HS2 developing at the same time, that's probably unlikely. One of the key features is it's a tilting train which allows faster speeds through the curves, up to 30% faster through curves which is great because it smooths out the speed profile and it also helps with the energy performance as well as the train's not repeatedly slowing down the accelerator again. The benign car train has got a continuous power rating of 6.7 megawatts, <coughs> which 6 megawatts is for the traction equipment, 6 traction converters, and the other 70 kilowatts is for the train auxiliaries. The trains are designed for regenerative braking, so uh, that when, we, when the train goes into brake, the energy is regenerated back into the supply into the grid. The trains have got distributed power, so it's not a locomotive or power car. Uh, all the power equipment is distributed along the length of the, of the train set. First trains carried passengers. There was a preview service in July 2002, and they ran between Birmingham and Manchester, uh, and it was part of the Commonwealth Games. And, 2002. So here we are 20 years later, just having had the Commonwealth Games in, in Birmingham. Uh, service introduction on, on the main route was from June 2003. And at present, which actually yesterday, the, the mileage of the fleet is now at 291 million miles. And those original trains, uh, the 53 original, 52 original trains as it is now, uh, the highest mileage train has done 5.5 million miles. I think the lowest mileage of them is 5.1. So they've all done more than 5 million miles. So they work extremely hard. <clears throat> and this is the configuration of the, the train. Um, so it was originally configured with four, four cars of first class and five cars of standard class. Uh, you can see the current collection equipment, the pantograph, which is on car three and car six. Uh, although both are showed raised there on this, on this picture, and the train only runs with a single pantograph raised. Right. We count over two pantographs up because we get, um, it, it can put a standing wave in the overhead line. It's designed to remove a single pantograph. And you can see where we've got the powered axles, which run the two inner axles. Of cars one, three, four, six, eight, and nine. And there. <clears throat> so, looking at the design, uh, it was important that we, we designed, we, we defined the constraints of the design as early as possible in the project because there's nothing worse than starting off on a project, getting partway through the development, and then suddenly finding the goalposts have moved. Um, so that, that was one of the key things we wanted to establish at, at an early day. We benefited from the traction system design being a, a development of what Austin were already producing on other projects. Um, so we had the class 460 and class 458 trains for Catholic Express and Southwest trains. And they were 750 volt DC train. And we also had the Scott Rail class 334 EMUs, which was a 25 kV train. It was very similar. In, in concept to the Pendolino, 
but that's only a three car train. The electrical system requirements are quite well defined. Um, there was a train infrastructure interface specification, and that set out the, the line voltage limits, the, the current limits, the power limits. Uh, and that was supported by the rail track standards that were in place at the time. So, so at, at that level, that, that, that was quite easy to, to see what we had to comply with. What was more difficult was the electromagnetic compatibility limits uh, for the signaling systems and other line side systems. They were not so, not so well defined. <clears throat> so one of the things we had to do was to develop a, a register of assets uh, to determine what equipment was fitted on all the routes and to understand the, uh, what we had to do to be compatible with them, the susceptibility of these different systems. So we talk about train detection systems. And these are systems that are used to detect presence of a train by the signaling system. Uh, so where we have DC track circuits, they inject a DC, a DC signal across the rails. When a train is present, then the train shorts that out and that detects that you've got a train in the section. Uh, what we have to avoid is that your train's not producing currents in the rail that could actually work in, in that opposition to that and in effect cancel out the fact that you've got a train detected. So there's limits set to, to what DC current can be generated. <clears throat> there's also 83 and a third hertz track circuits and this was a particularly interesting one. <clears throat> this was quite an old track circuit. And we had to develop um, dedicated independent hardware to monitor 83 and a third hertz faults um, <clears throat> with its own self test that each day it tested to check that it was working. Somewhat ir <clears throat> ironically, uh, by the time the trains entered service, the last of these 83 and a third hertz track circuits had already been taken out. So the equipment was fitted, fully integrated with all the electronics, including a quite complex self-test, uh, <clears throat> but wasn't required for its original function. Uh, but it was actually more difficult to take it out than it was to leave it in. And as it's turned out, as we go on later on in the, in the lecture, it's actually become quite useful. Uh, and then there's some more, uh, uh, more modern track circuits, such as V-Track circuits, TI-21 and the HBI, which are which are all coded systems operating at different frequencies. And then subsequently, there were axle counters also introduced. In addition to the train detection, there's all the other line side systems. So the signal post telephones, um, data links, line side data links, which are associated with the signaling system, SSI, which is solid state interlocking, um, which gains part of the signaling uh, control, CCTV, things like level crossings. Uh, and, and other networks which might be line side. So we had all those systems that we, we had to remain compatible with and make sure that we didn't interfere, particularly with the voice based systems. <clears throat> so we then set about some infrastructure limits um, and they set the constraints for designing the traction system. Uh, and then that allowed us to specify the system in order to respect those compatibility limits. Um, and some of the key features. Uh, the, the main transformer was designed with a, a low inch current to minimize the, the DC component. And it also has a high reactance in the secondary and tertiary windings to reduce the current ripple. Traction converters were, were IGBT technology, which came in from the mid 1990s. Uh, so it was relatively new technology at the time. Uh, I think it first came in on Northern Line, cheap stock with Alstom. And then with the Juniper trains, uh, medium frequency switching, uh, and we've got insulation of the four quadrant converters, which are the front end converters, in order to minimize the, the harmonics. Similarly, with the auxiliary converters, the same technology, uh, and, and again with insulation of the four quadrant converters. This is the uh, simplified block diagram of a nine car train. Uh, and in effect, there's, there's two, four car, it, it, it's symmetrical around the middle of the train, apart from the, the roof equipment. And um, so we've got uh, four cars, there's a, there's a VCB connecting to the overhead line, one of the v, either VCB, one on the left, or VCB, one on the right, is closed. Uh, that feeds the main transformer. 
main transformer, uh, secondary is kept out through the control case, and then go to three traction converters. And the traction converters on the, the three motor cars to one side of the transformer, one at the other side of the transformer. And then the same is repeated at the other end of the train. So electrically, the two halves of the train are, are identical. Now, I mentioned that we only run with one pantograph raised. And so that means we've got to get the 25 kV down to the, the transformer at the other end of the train. So for that, we have a, an insulated 25 kV cable that runs along the roof. Uh, and in between vehicles, there's a, a flexible connection, which you can see in the picture, which is referred to as the curly cable. Uh, and that has to cope with the side to side movement of the train, the vertical movement of the train, and also the tilting. So one vehicle might be the tilting with respect to the other one. So there's a lot of work into, into designing that component to make sure it wasn't going to have any, any failures, mechanical failures, particularly if it's carrying 25 kV. Uh, <clears throat> when we stand at the closure of the VCBs, so the pantograph VCB, VCB1 closes first, and then five seconds later, VCB2 closes to energize the second transformer. <clears throat> this overlays the traction equipment onto the, the diagram we we're looking at before. So we can see where we've got the main transformer and the pantograph and VCBs on the car three. And then the secondary cables come out to the traction converters on the other vehicles with a 25 kV bus line going along the roof. And this is the simplified system architecture. So each transformer has got three secondary windings, uh, four quadrant converter, feeding a, a DC link, a control DC link, and then a three phase inverter feeding a variable voltage, variable frequency output. So two traction motors in parallel. So the, the three four quadrant converters on each transformer are interlaced, uh, the fine angles are interlaced at 120 degrees, which minimizes the switching harmonics. Um, so that reduces the, the main switching harmonics. Just looking in a bit more detail, uh, you can see the front end four quadrant converter with the IGBT bridge. Uh, we've then got a 100 hertz filter to take out the 100 hertz ripple from the line. Uh, traction inverter feeding the motors. And there's also a, a DC chopper, which is connected to a roof mounted brake resistor. So if the uh, regenerative brake is not uh, enabled, uh, you can dissipate energy into the brake resistor on the roof. That's replicated three times for the traction groups. Uh, and then at the bottom, we've got the auxiliary converter, which is slightly simpler. And that, before, that, that the output of that is a fixed frequency voltage, uh, 450, 400 volt, 50 hertz output with three phase systems. So we'll then start to look at um, what do these limits that we've defined mean in terms of the performance? Uh, and we, we split the frequency range into three ranges. Uh, so these, this shows the limits between 50 hertz and 550 hertz. So at 50 hertz, this is a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side. So we've got 300 amps limit for the train at 50 hertz. And then that then sets a limits defined in the standards for about 40 amps at 150 hertz. And then coming down to 10 amps at 250 hertz. Uh, and then you can see the first group of track circuits, which are between 350 hertz and 450 hertz. And uh, there are frequencies which we have to avoid with the traction equipment, the traction converter. Now, if we overlay some real data onto there, there you can see a typical, typical current waveform with the harmonics. Uh, and one of the great benefits of the, the IGBT technology and the medium frequency switching is that we have quite low third, fifth, and seventh harmonics, um, which is good for the power supply quality. Going up to the next range of frequency between 500 hertz and 3 kilohertz, um, this is where we start to see the TI-21 track circuits. I think that means traction immune track circuits centered around 2100 hertz. So there's a, there's a series of uh, sensitive bands there that we must avoid. And here you can see the 
the harmonics lay, over, overlaid onto it, you know, with a, with a good margin at the critical frequencies. And then up at the high frequency range between 2.5 kilohertz and 12.5 kilohertz, uh, there's no signal systems around there. So this is where <clears throat> this is where we have our traction traction and auxiliary converter harmonics. Um, so the auxiliary converter, the first set of harmonics from them is centered on 3.1 kilohertz. And the first set of traction harmonics is centered around 3.7 kilohertz. And then that's repeated up at 6.2, 7.4, 9.3, and, and so on. Um, so you can see that uh, in normal operation, uh, the highest harmonic current to the switching harmonics is about 700, 700 milliamps. Now, this is with all the traction converters operating and all the interlacing working correctly to, to cancel out the harmonics. If we get a, a fault on one of the traction converters, so we have imperfect interlacing, uh, we then see a, an increase in the amplitude, but the frequency stays the same. So in the degraded mode, and then that, that harmonic goes up to, to more than one amp. Uh, and well, that's still well within the limits, and, and that's what we design the trains to be able to operate uh, in, a, in the degraded mode. So that's the, that's, that's the limits that we set and how we, we aim to, to achieve the, the design. And this is what we did to, to validate and verify it. Um, so it was important that something as complex as this is that we took a staged approach and we could validate the key elements at the earliest opportunity in the, in the design and build program. Uh, key to that was our combined test facility. This was at our stone factory in Preston. And there we built a, <clears throat> a pre-series uh, or pre-production uh, half set of traction equipment that was installed on the test bed. So this had a complete half train with a transformer, three traction converters, two auxiliary converters, and the motors as well. And we were able to drive that against load machines, which would simulate the profile of the route and the loading of the route. Uh, it allowed us to start performing conducted emission testing to look at the harmonics um, on, on the test bed. Uh, and every time we got a new a software delivery, we could do regression and non-regression testing to make sure that there's no unexplained changes. Uh, and it allows us to do tuning the design functions away from the train. And I think the, the combined test was first set up in 1999, and it remained there for about four years, about 2003. So it was, it was there to support as long as we had issues with trains and, and as we started to run them on the track. We could go back to the test bed and see if we could reproduce the effects. One big step that was taken was the decision to reinstate and electrify the, the test track at Old Dolby. So this was a railway line that bound between Melton Mulberry and the outskirts of Nottingham. It's about 12 mile test track. Probably most famously known uh, when they did a test on the nuclear flask in the 1970s or early 1980s, where they drove, drove a locomotive into a nuclear flask to demonstrate that it wouldn't be damaged. Um, we were using it for somewhat less severe testing. Um, <clears throat> you know, but the, the whole line when the was upgraded and electrified, it was electrified with different types of equipment to, to try to replicate all the different types of OLE that were present on the West Coast Main Line. Um, some of the track was deliberately poor quality to, again to try to reproduce the, the worst case effects. And there's a, the, the offices were, or the, the main facility was part of an old mine that was built. I say it was an old mine, I think it was actually built in the 1970s and only lasted about 10 years before it closed. Um, but we made use of that facility and it's still there now as a network rail test track. And we constructed two pre series trains. Um, so these were used to validate the performance on the test track and on infrastructure. And pre series one was primarily used for the electrical testing, and pre series two was mainly used for tilt testing. And initially, pre series one didn't have the tilt system commissioned. And pre series two, we also did electrical testing on there and we did a, some of the same equipment we had on pre series one, but pre series one was predominantly the electrical stuff. 
<laughs> when I say there were three series trains, there was, there was very few seats in them. I think when we first started, I don't think there's any toilets in them either. So uh, once we started going out onto infrastructure with long nights of testing, uh, that, that wasn't ideal. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the test program, uh, they went back to the factory and they were rebuilt and became 390.001 and 390.002. And they were actually the last two trains to go into service. So having done our testing on the test track and demonstrated that the train was fit to go into the infrastructure, uh, we were then allowed out initially for testing in, in controlled conditions. We know that with the specific areas where we were doing a train operating, and if, if we managed to interfere with any of the equipment, there was no uh, adverse consequences. Once we'd done our testing in the test sites, uh, we then started to do what was called line site compatibility testing on all the service routes. So that meant we take the train out and run it on all the service routes and just ask the signalers and other people involved uh, to advise if they see any anomalies. Uh, and some of them have been looking forward for this for, for many years because they've had lots of little anomalies that, that with every train that passes, that uh, they could then plug it up against our train and get it addressed. So certainly some of the issues that were flagged up were nothing to do with our train, but they were there already. Uh, and, and then as we got motor train testing in pre-series one and pre-series two testing together. Every train that came out of the factory, we did a, a routine footprint test of electrical characteristics. So those harmonics, which I showed before, in the different ranges, uh, we, we, we took measurements from the first train and, and set that as, an, as, the, as the limit for the other trains. So we weren't working to the infrastructure limits, we were working to the actual measures values to, to ensure that all the trains were consistent. This shows our test facility at Preston. Uh, in the top left-hand corner in the box at high up, that's where we've got the 25 kV equipment. The cable coming down, and then you can see the transformer on the left middle, um, suspended off the, off, the, off the frame. And then we've got a traction case uh, alongside it on the right. There's another two traction cases beneath it. Uh, you can see some of the brake resistors, um, which were normally mounted on the roof in the foreground, and underneath in the sound booths of the traction motors. So you can imagine that's, uh, that's quite a, a setup, that test equipment. So it sat there for five years, <coughs> and it proved it incredibly useful. So say so we had the dynamic test program. Um, the first train uh, was the first movement test in, in the factory at Washford, just a couple of miles away from here, January 2001. I remember it quite well. We were told we had to be here for nine o'clock in the morning because that's when we were going to test it. Uh, we actually got on the train at 9.30 at night. Uh, and there's, yeah, I, I was challenged by the test manager as to how many traction packs would be working out of the six. Uh, you, you reckon it wouldn't have more than two. So I said six. And in the end, we got five. So I was reasonably well satisfied. One minor issue was the train went in the wrong direction. <laughs> so, so we put it in forward, it went in reverse. So, so from all the validation that we'd done and all the verification, one thing that we'd missed was the actual direction that the motors rotated. <clears throat> well, at least that was quite easy to fix. <clears throat> and we're only doing five miles long. Um, test track went in on the first train started in April 2001. Uh, we actually had one particular high profile event uh, when we launched the trains to the railway press and the national press uh, with Richard Branson and with a, a fly pass from two red arrows because we couldn't afford more than two. So, <laughs> um, and, and that was a, a great way of promoting the project and getting people looking forward to the trains coming to, coming to service. So over 2001, we started the mainline testing, uh, initially between Carnport and Carlisle up in the Lake District, and then Nuneaton to Rugby, which is where we did the, the highest speed testing, which won 40. And the test sequence was we started off at 110 miles an hour non-tilt, because if we, got, if we get the train certified for 110 miles an hour uh, <clears throat> without the tilt system, then we could start to replace the existing trains running on the, on the network and it's the same time tables. The next stage was 125 miles an hour tilt, which was needed for the speeded up timetable. 
<clears throat> and then eventually what was known as pub two was going to be 140 mile an hour tilt with uh, automatic signaling in the car. Uh, and, and that never progressed, unfortunately. So and then we, we, we went through this long program of blindside compatibility testing. So we had to run the trains on all the routes, including all the diversion routes in both directions uh, and control conditions with people monitoring the power supply and the signaling of the blindside systems, um, checking that there's no anomalies identified. <clears throat> and, and this is where we started to see some of the issues. Um, the, the first one <clears throat> to mention, this is one that got picked up at Old, Old, Old Dolby, <clears throat> was when we were doing the RFI testing. So this is radiated emissions from the train. So we we'll have to test to uh, recognize again standard. <clears throat> and this is a standard for the complete vehicle. Um, so you, you've got uh, antenna mounted line side and the train is passing by the antenna. So you're not only picking up the emissions from the train, you're also picking up anything that's in your red line as well. Uh, initially, <clears throat> it showed the two areas of concern. Um, there are exceedances at 11 kilohertz, which is one of the traction switching harmonics. Um, <clears throat> and that depended on whereabouts on the track we were. I think there were resonant issues with the red line. So there were some, some locations on the track where you could get high 11 kilohertz currents. And then there are also much higher frequency exceedances, uh, 450 kilohertz and 650 kilohertz that are very localized to the train. And <laughs> it was identified that these were due to the intercar uh, jumper cables, which are the secondary connections from the transformer to the traction case, which were on different vehicles. It was also picked up that these 11 kilohertz emissions and may also cause interference with some of the, the line side data links, the solid state interlocking. Um, because I, th I think they worked at a, a similar frequency and we, we could end up swamping them with our emissions, which would mean that they, they started to give false, false information. But I think they always fell to the safe condition, which of course it, it, it caused unreliability. So we had to look at what we could do uh, now that we'd already built the trains to try to reduce the emissions of 7 kilohertz. And we actually came up with quite a simple solution because we, we had the two halves of the train, which were each interlaced at 0, 60, uh, 120, 0, 60, 120. Um, but both halves of the train were identical. So what we said was if we offset one, one end of the train by 30 degrees with respect to the other end of the train, and that would give us a cancellation of the harmonics at the key frequencies we were concerned with. Now, I remember the first time we did this, uh, I think we got a bit of error board in some RC networks and did some testing on the test bed to work out what, what delay we need to put into the uh, signal from the reference transformer to, 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 to cause that 30 degree um, offset. We did that on the test bed and then immediately rolled that onto the trains. Um, but ultimately it was, it was implemented in software as a software change. And it was successful in that it uh, attenuated the harmonics by a factor of three, which was enough to be uh, what, what we needed. Uh, and then for the intercar jumpers, um, the solution is simply to an earth screen conductor. So this is the uh, results from the testing with the, uh, with, with the changed interlacing. Um, so you can see the 11 kilohertz component, which was initially about, uh, about 600 milliamps, was reduced down to 200 milliamps, uh, with no adverse change on the, the, the harmonics. And this is looking at the radiated emissions, uh, where you can see it's 11 kilohertz, we've got an 8 dB improvement. Uh, so it's a quite a simple change that, that didn't cost very much to implement, but it was very critical in moving the test program forward. Um, these are the intercar jumper, jumper cables. I mean, we're, we're passing about 2,200 amps when we're accelerating between vehicles. Uh, so we've got three goals and three returns in parallel. Uh, ideally, you'd like to arrange the MC to get some cancellation between the, the fuels 
um, which is generated by each cable, um, but because of the physical arrangement, that wasn't possible. But what we did do is, is we, we, we fitted an earth cable, uh, which is just tied to the secondary cable, to the power cable, and that did a very good job of, uh, of pulling the, the generated coolness. In fact, what we did find subsequently is that we, we started to find some problems in the trains because some of the some of the uh, some of the earth and cable some of the earth cable started to fracture with movement, uh, and then we started to get issues on the train as well because when we have some cables with earth straps and some cables without, we can actually create uh, emissions that, that were upsetting the systems on the train. So we touched on line side compatibility testing. This is taking the train out, running it around the network. Um, so we're operating in control conditions. Um, and as we went around, we started to pick up different issues. One of the first ones was to do with level crossing and CCTV monitors. You know, some of these CCTV systems were quite old technology. Uh, and, and some of the cable wasn't in very good condition either. And while they've been perfectly happy with the trains that have gone past for the sort of previous 20 years with their phase angle control, uh, once we started to run trains that were generating these higher frequency harmonics, we started to get noise on the on the signals that they're seeing in the signal box. You know, so typically as a, as a class 390 came into the electrical section, we start to see snow on the pictures on the CCTV monitor. Um, and, and the, the three locations were a particular issue. Now, I think there was already a program looking to, to modernize these anyway. So that got pushed forward um, on the, the cables replaced by fiber optics, which solved the issue. Unfortunately, there's very few, there's very few level crossings on the West Coast mainland anyway, and that's only been taken out. Now, the other thing we found was with a, a lot of the signaling related data link systems where, where we started to have interference problems. And uh, when you hear people talking about we're now going to a digital railway with digital signaling that's going to make everything much better and re reduce all the, get rid of all this Victorian era uh, equipment, we, we've had digital signaling systems running in the UK for probably about 40 years. Um, with the solid state interlocking that was usually developed by British Railway Engineering, British Rail Research. Um, and again, it really was a similar sort of problem, is that we're now running ground trains that's got higher frequency harmonics being generated and radiated. Uh, and this was, we found that some of the systems were susceptible. Now, there was different money, there was a standard set of parts, which was sort of written on the series of standard specifications. But then there were different suppliers. So although functionally they were all performing the same function, they weren't identical. So as you got different mixes of, of different components, uh, there's some places where, where we got particular issues. Uh, and certainly anywhere where there was problems with screening and earthing, um, that, 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 that got picked up. Now, I think Atkins were involved with this and, and they introduced some, some means of remote monitoring a lot of these systems. So you could see if the train was causing an issue or not um, with, before it actually became a, a problem for the signal. Uh, gradually, uh, working through it all, I think we identified the components that were, were the weakest. Uh, there were some places where we, we fitted extra isolating transformers. Um, somewhat ironically, one of the, the worst affected systems was one supplied by Alstom. So uh, what, what, uh, it, 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 eventually it was, it was sorted out and all through the, down the West Coast main line, these issues were addressed. Now, when they started running the, the IEP trains on the East Coast main line a few years ago, lo and behold, they had exactly the same sort of problems. Because although the, the lessons had been learned on West Coast, they hadn't been carried across onto East Coast. Um, so a similar exercise had to be performed on East Coast Main Line. One of the other one, one of the other issues was related to overhead line resonance. 
Um, so, so that was first picked up on our class C34 in use in Scotland when we were testing. We found that there were some places where they could get uh, very high peak voltages on the overhead uh, due to interaction of, this, of the harmonics and, and resonances in the overhead supply. Uh, to try to avoid that, the pre series change were fitted with voltage alarms. So if we if got excessive peak voltages or excessive ripple voltages, that, that sounded the alarm, uh, which, which flagged up that that needed to be analyzed subsequently. Uh, we also recorded the signals so we could do some voltage mapping with the loops. Some specific tests were performed at test site A to look at the peak voltages uh, when a class 90 locomotive operated and when a class 390 operated. Now, as quite often happens when you compare the old technology with the new technology, the highest peak voltages were with the, the old technology, but nobody had ever been picked it up before. Um, but, but, but with the class 90, it, it, they, they, they tend to be transients, where with the, with the, with the 390, with the modern train, uh, they were, the harmonics were there all the time. So it was potentially more of an issue. Uh, so it was determined that what we had to try to do was to limit the peak to peak, peak voltage uh, to avoid damage to infrastructure, over line equipment, and also to avoid damage to other trains. Uh, so the, the target was to keep it below 85.6 kV peak to peak uh, for 99.5% of the time. And this is at a, an operating voltage of 27.5 kV. So I think that leaves us about 6 kV for the ripple on top of the, the 50 hertz sine wave. And this was achieved by fitting electrical filters um, line side on the infrastructure. Um, so there's two, two dampers, electrical dampers were fitted on each electrical section uh, with the aim of giving a, a minimum impedance of two kilohms, uh, less than two, less than five, and less than two. Uh, I mean, the, the train effectively operates as a, as a current source with, with the harmonics it produces. So if, if you end up with a, a section of line with a, a 10k ohm impedance at that particular frequency, then we can generate quite high ripple voltages. Um, so, so installation of the dampers became a prerequisite to the full service introduction. And that was what allowed us to sort of run the initial service from Birmingham to Manchester in 2002, but it was 2003 before we were able to come down to London and want to address these issues. As time's gone on, uh, modeling techniques have got much better. And I think these, we have a much better understanding of these phenomena. And I'm sure a, a lot of these dampers were not really required, but because it, we, we couldn't predict exactly where they needed to be fitted. They were fitted everywhere on the system. And indeed, I think there's a couple of places now where we're talking about taking them out as, as the line's upgraded. Axle counters uh, were another interesting problem. Uh, the axle counter is uh, there's a, a sensor coil and a transmitter coil uh, mounted either side of the rail. And it operated frequency of about 30 kilohertz. And as, <coughs> as the axle passes through, and the, the metal goes between the, the two coils, and that gives a pulse, which is detected and counts the axle. Uh, and they're, they're mounted periodically along the route. Each one got, gives a signal back to its local electronics, decides how many axles that train has, and compares it to how many axles it had when it passed the previous one to make sure that you've not lost some vehicles. Um, so, so it's, so it's a, a means of doing train detection by, by counting the axles for each train as they're going along. When that was first introduced, they first introduced on the North Staffordshire line. Uh, I think the, the train was there first, so the axle counters had to be compatible with the train. And, and that was demonstrated to be satisfactory. Uh, they became the preferred train detection component. Uh, so they then started to be rolled out across the system. But as they went across the system, they started to find some reliability problems, particularly where they fitted close to neutral sections. So this is where the train goes from one supply to another, to a, a neutral section where the, the circuit breaker opens and recloses. Initially, the worst affected site was Bourne End, which was near Hemel Hempstead. Uh, at that time, we used to operate with the front pantograph raised. Uh, but then the decision was taken to switch to the rear pantograph, which was preferred. 
uh, and we suddenly found that the performance at one end improved, um, but that's what counts as became far more recovered rugby in a different location. So this was giving us a clue as to some of the factors that might be involved in, in what was causing this. Uh, there was a joint working group set up to investigate the issue between Network Well, Talis, uh, Bridge and Alstom and Atkins when the tests were brought. Um, and they installed some test axle counter heads at one end in rugby to measure the radiated fields um, so, so to, to, to capture what the, um, the antenna would have seen. And this, show, this shows the arrangement. This is the test on, antenna that Atkins developed mounted to the rails at, at rugby. Uh, and what we're looking to do is to see if there's any currents detected in running in the rails that, that might um, affect the, the, the actual counter count. And the, <clears throat> this is a typical measurement. Now, rugby is close to the neutral section. So the, the, the x-axis is time. So at the, at the left-hand side, you, you, you see a fast transient on the traces. And that's as the train comes through the neutral section and the circuit breaker closes and there's a transient that's captured. And then as the traction converter starts, we sort of see a low frequency, a low amplitude signal, which, which doesn't cause any problems. And then you see the axles going through the, as, as the train passes the axle counter head, you see the, the axles detected. Uh, and then when we looked at that transient signal, we actually saw that there are, uh, there's, a, there's a frequency of about close to 28 kilohertz and 30 kilohertz, which is, which is sensitive frequency when we analyze that, that inrush waveform. So, so what, was, what was happening on the train to produce those frequencies? And what we actually have is, is this is a simplified power, power scheme. On the left hand side, we've got circuit breaker and one transformer. Then we've got the 25 kV cable being put down several cars connecting to the other transformer. And as the, as the circuit breaker closes, uh, you've got the capacitance of the cable, which is being energized. And it was that the inrush into the cable capacitance that was causing these very high frequency spikes to be, to be detected. And depending on the on the length of the of the of the train, and which type of cable it was, and on what point in the wave it switched, is, is whether you ended up with getting a, a potentially a signal that could cause interference. And I think the, the worst case that was measured, um, the worst case transient that was measured during the testing was 2.2 milliseconds. So this was uh, detecting a, a false axle for 2.2 milliseconds. Now within the software, in the, in the monitoring equipment, um, the pulse with us regression 2.4 milliseconds to account as a, as a genuine signal. So you can start to see how uh, every now and then you, you might get the incorrect count because you get a fast transient. Uh, the actual counter then says it's got an inconsistency so the train has been brought to a stop to investigate. So the, the solution that was adopted was to, was to extend that 2.4 milliseconds delay up to four milliseconds in the axle counter detection equipment and, and that resolved the issue. Um, so that, that, that was quite a, a lengthy investigation and a, a lot of good engineering work went on there to, to get to the bottom of it. And then of course when we put the two extra cars in we change the characteristics again because we put some more capacitance in there. We thought we'd probably solve the problem when we put the two extra cars in. So uh, the, the additional cars, um, <clears throat> so I think it was about 2008, we got the contract for the 106 additional vehicles. <clears throat> 35 trains were being extended from nine car to 11 car by putting two extra vehicles there. And then there were four complete new nine car trains, or in fact, they were delivered as 11 car trains. Also as part of that, the Alston maintenance contract was extended to 2022. So that, that finished earlier this year. Unfortunately, we managed to get an extension. Uh, and that gave us an expanded fleet of 35 11 car trains and 21 nine car trains. There was also an option <clears throat> to extend the remaining nine car trains to 11 car, uh, which got pushed for on, on many occasions, but, but never happened. They never will do now. 
Uh, the first new train was validated as an 11 car in, in 2011, but because we only had um, safety case for operating as nine car, we, we tested it and proved it as an 11 car, and then took two cars out and it entered service as a nine car. And the remaining new trains were, were, <coughs> were delivered between the end of 2011 and April 2012. And from April 2012, we started putting the two new cars into the nine cars <coughs> at a rate of one train a week. Yes. <clears throat> so a train will come into the depot as a nine car, uh, be split up, two new cars put in, all the testing done, including harmonic testing, and it's back out again a week later. That was a good program. Uh, and the two additional cars were actually dropped in between the existing first class and the standard class. Now, if you remember how, how the, the bus, the 25kb bus line connected between the vehicles, um, these two new cars have got the 25kb bus line on. Uh, so it gives us the opportunity to, to tee off the bus line to connect another circuit breaker, the transformer on, the, on one of the cars. When the additional cars was being discussed, I think the, the, the trains are originally designed to be extended up to 10 cars by putting an extra trailer car in. And clearly that would have been the easiest way to extend the trains, but, but it was decided that wouldn't give enough capacity for, for what was required. Um, Alstom's preferred arrangement was to go to 12 car train because that would allow us to push in a transfer car into traction cars, um, but, but that wouldn't fit in in a lot of the stations. Uh, so, so we ended up with an 11 car and we looked at whether you could do that without any extra power or not. Um, <clears throat> but to keep the journey times, particularly if you've got equipment failures, we needed to make sure that those new cars were, were powered cars. So we added a, an extra transformer and an extra car with traction equipment. So you see where previously we had six traction converters with the interlacing of the four quadrant converters. We've now got seven, which is not an easy number to, to interlace. Um, so, so that third transformer and traction case is not interlaced with the others. Uh, and, and that gives us a slight increase. Um, we'll see it around about three, just below three kilohertz. We start to see some increase from the extra auxiliary converter. And here on the, the traction harmonics, uh, you can see that the 11 car train has a slightly higher harmonics than the, the nine car train. Um, but we're still able to operate it with the adequate margin with the, the, the limits on the system. So that sort of takes us through to 10 years ago when we introduced the new trains. Uh, and then since then, uh, we've been involved with several different schemes. Um, one of the first things we did uh, with, with the, in fact, we did it on the back of the new train testing, the 11 car train testing, is we, we were actually running a train up and down in the East Coast main line. At one time, there was talk of running a Pendolino in service on the East Coast. Um, also, we were also keen to sell Pendolino trains to the East Coast as well because the class 91s were, were getting old. Uh, so, we, 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 did one, we did a test run one night. Uh, I think we're joining that test run. Uh, it's, the train started off at Wembley, came up to Preston where we joined it, then went to Glasgow, then across to Edinburgh, then back down the East Coast and ended up at uh, King's Cross, about five miles from where it started off. Uh, so that was a long test run that night. And, and then we went back the other way the, the following night. Uh, and, and that allowed us to do similar line site compatibility testing to make sure that there was no issues. There were other trains running in service at the time. Um, and, uh, and we also did uh, some impedance mapping, voltage impedance mapping, because of concerns that the particular characteristics of the power supply on the East Coast main line might, might have more resonance issues. Um, following on from that, to, to support the West Coast power supply upgrade, where a lot of the power supply was upgraded to auto transformer, with the auto transformer feeding. We, we, we used the instrumented train, instrumented class 390 train to do some testing and impedance mapping. And we also looked at operation with and without OLE dampers. 
uh, and then we supported the Northwest Electrification Program, sort of from 2013 onwards, as, uh, as its various routes in the, in the Northwest were electrified. Again, by use, using the train as a, as a load bank, uh, landsat compatibility testing, and when we had instrumented train available during impedance mapping. This is some of the results from some of the stuff we did on, on the East Coast. Um, with a train at King's Cross at the top alongside of Mark Fawcett and, and at Edinburgh. Um, and this is an example of the overhead line impedance mapping. So if you look at if you see on the 3D map, uh, we've got this, we've got one scale is time, one is frequency, and the other is impedance. So as the train is traveling along, as the time changes, you can see the impedance of the line changes as, it, as the train moves along. Uh, and, and at different frequencies. Uh, and then this is a map within a particular section showing what the peak uh, impedances were. It's 4.6 kilo ohms in this case. So, so that gave some very useful information on the characteristics of the East Coast Main Line. And we started to support the, the Northwest Electrification Program. Uh, there's various phases. The first phase, phase one, was from the, the West Coast Main Line near Warrington into Manchester. Uh, phase two was from the West Coast Main Line west to, to Liverpool, and also from Liverpool to, to Wigan via St. Helens. Phase three was Preston to Blackpool. And then the last one, phase four, was filling the gap from Manchester via Bolton to, to Preston. Um, so at different times, the, the train, which some, sometimes the train was instrumented, sometimes it was just acting as a load bank, but with uh, using the onboard systems to monitor key signals. Um, this was a, a rather noisy graph, but there was a particularly interesting test that we did uh, as part of the phase one testing, where we, we arranged to have two trains uh, accelerating towards each other, drawing maximum power at the far end of the of the line from the feeder. So, so, so it's being fed from Parkside back on the, on the West Coast Main Line. And this is the end of the section. Windsor Street is in Salford, um, which is 29.75 miles from, from Liverpool. Uh, so we had one train, 391 set off from, from Eccles, accelerating, heading east. And then we had the other train, 390119, heading west from Windsor with a synchronized start, all trains taking full power uh, and, and seeing what effect that has on the, on the, on the line voltage. So that shows them, uh, and you can see the trains crossed about a, a mile from where they set off. Uh, and that's against distance. This is against time. Uh, and the green trace is, is the total primary current so we're drawing a maximum of about 530 amps at, at 25 kV. Uh, you see the line voltage trace um, is the red and the orange traces. Uh, so the trains, when we, st when we started off, we were at about 26.5 kV. So trains are taking full power. The voltage came down to 25 kV. And then both trains went into, into regen break as well. So we then start pushing energy back into the supply. And you see the power go back up again to, to 27 kV. Um, so so that, that was a, a good test that took quite a bit of setting up. Um, the first time we tried it was a miserable failure. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a countdown, three, two, one, go. And we set off and about two minutes later, we saw the other one set off. So, you know, the idea of three, two, one, go was we started together. Uh, but the second time was very successful and, uh, and was very useful. To, to demonstrate that the, the supply was, was solid. Um, this is some of the later testing. This was between Preston and, and Piccadilly. Uh, so the new section was between Exton Junction and, and Salford Crescent. Uh, and, and what people were looking to do is it was both the voltage regulation and also check, checking that they've got the right currents running in all the, all the parallel cables. Now, if, if a train just runs into the section and accelerates and then runs at line speed, uh, it'll take a high current initially, but once you really got line speed, it takes very low current. So what we did, uh, we set the train up so that it was constantly cycling between about 40 miles an hour 
And I think we'll go up to about 70 miles an hour. So we'd accelerate up full power up to 70, and then go into regen brakes so and get the maximum brake back down to 40, and then back up again. So you can see the train cycling along. Um, and you can see the line voltage going up and down as we're drawing power and then regenerating power. Uh, and as you get closer to the feeder station, which is at the right hand end, uh, you see the regulation reduces, the change in voltage reduces. Um, so so that, that gave the people monitoring the power system uh, decent sized currents to, to look at and to, to confirm that everything was working properly. I remember on the first night of the testing, I think we, we came into the section at the testing end at Exton Junction and we immediately got a phone call that there was a firework display going off at, in Salford <laughs> and uh, one, one of the line switches hadn't been put back in properly. So it was, it was, it was okay while there was no significant current being drawn. But as, as soon as we arrived on the scene, well, even 20 miles away, it, uh, it, we, we actually got a video sent through and it was quite impressive. <clears throat> so that, um, <clears throat> that, that took us through all the, the, the things we did with the train to support the, the infrastructure development. Uh, in recent years, we've, we've set up, we've been involved with this group, which is over the line performance improvement. Uh, and that was, that group was established in January 2019 with Network Rail, Avanti and Alstom. And the aim of the group is to try to see what we can do to reduce the amount of OLE defects. Now, a, a typical dewirement, <clears throat> when you bring the wires down, a uh, typical cost is £2 million to Network Rail. So, uh, so that there's a, a lot of money available to invest in innovation um, if you can help reduce the number of those failures. Uh, and, and we started off doing a bit of a, bit of a, a mind dump as, as to what sort of things could be could cause issues and what we might be able to do with the train to, to try to, to detect them. Uh, and then on the right hand side, I think this is where we're at the moment with the different work streams we've got going. Uh, so we've got one work stream where we're mon called APC monitoring, which is looking at automatic power control. Uh, one called ARC detection, and another one called event mapping. And those three work streams are all using data that's available on the train in the existing traction, traction event logs. Uh, we've then got pan cameras, pantograph cameras, CCTV. We did some initial trials with a CCTV pantograph camera. And I think within a few days of it being fitted, it was actually involved in the dewirement of, of, of the 112 pantographs on the system. It just happened it was this particular train. And that immediately showed everybody how valuable this information was. Because previously when we had a dewirement, it was always a case of, you know, with two million pounds at stake, was it the train at fault or was it the infrastructure? And uh, we usually end up getting external consultants in, looking at mangled bits of metal and trying to come to a conclusion as to what might have caused it. Um, so, so on the back of that, Network Rail actually paid to have pantograph cameras fitted on, on every Pendolino train, on every pantograph. So now all, all 56 trains have got pantograph cameras on both pantographs. Uh, on the back of that, there's also this thing called ADD trigger. ADD is a, the auto drop device. If a pantograph gets damaged, um, it, it, there's, a, there's an air chamber. If the pressure leaks out of the air chamber, it pulls the pantograph down automatically to stop it damaging the wire. Um, so what we what we did there is if we detect the auto drop device operating, sends a signal to the CCTV system and it sends five minutes worth of data back to ground. So that when somebody calls in and says, we've got an issue with this train, we think we brought the wires down, the CCTV should be available within a few minutes. So you can actually see what's happened, whether you really have got the wires down or whether it's just a, a problem with the carbon. Uh, it also avoids the driver having to get off to do an inspection because there was, there was a case a few years ago where a driver got off in the dark to, to do an inspection and actually wandered into a live cable and, and got severely injured. Um, so anything that allows the driver to stay in the cab is, is a great benefit. Uh, some of the other systems we've got involved is fixed pantograph monitoring. So this is using trackside systems to monitor the pantographs on all the trains. Uh, that's That's gone... There's, there's, a, there's a lot of other systems going in in Scotland, um, not so much down in, in England yet, but there are plans to put them in. Um, AIVR, which is a, a video monitoring 
system, which has also been used with um, optical recognition to, to, to identify things like vegetation uh, and, and feeds data off to, uh, to the portals, which, which you can, can view. I mean, so some of these things were, were actually pushed in through COVID when, when people went out to go on the trains to inspect the track and it's actually become the, the new way of working. You know, with a great benefit that if it's all on video, you can replay it to your heart's content and analyze it. And, and the final one is a system known as PANDAS. And this is a pantograph monitoring system with an accelerometer fitted to the pantograph head. Uh, and it sends signals back to ground if you get any high, high impact events. And again, proving very successful at starting to pick up some of the defects before they become catastrophic. Um, <clears throat> so, this, so that's been a really good working group, everybody working together on it. Uh, now, you know, some of the things that have helped us from our side, from Arstam's side, and when these trains first started, um, when the train got in at the end of the day, somebody would go along with a computer and download the fault events on it. And the next day, if you're lucky, you get to see the fault events, and then the day after you'd be able to fix any faults you've got. Uh, very quickly became apparent that that was no way to run a railway with, with such complex trains. So, so we started to introduce some automatic downloading of uh, train management system, TMS system events in about 2006, 2007. Now that's evolved over the years into this, which, uh, which is now called Alstom Health Hub, which is a generic Alstom product. Uh, and it pulls in information from the train management system, from the traction system, from the tilt system, and also from other, other infrastructure-based systems as well. <clears throat> so we have uh, scanners at the depots that measure pantograph condition <clears throat> and measure brake pass. Uh, <clears throat> and all that goes into this health hub and can be used to generate alerts. <clears throat> and when an alert's raised, that sends a message to the people in the desk here in Birmingham who were monitoring the fleet to tell them there's an issue. So I think this was a, a screenshot I took earlier today. And then you can see some of the issues. Um, toilet waste tank for um, disabled toilet system, so the converters locked out. So, so we've got genuine live data. Uh, and if you have a, a major problem on a traction system, um, <clears throat> they will send an alert to the, to, the, to the fleet engineer so that by the time the, the driver rings in to say he's got a problem, the fleet engineer all, already knows what the problem is and what action needs to be taken. Because at the back of these alerts, there's also advice as, as what you need to do if it's a high, high priority or low priority. Um, <clears throat> So, so that's, that, that's a great way of, of starting to analyze all these masses of data. Yeah, <clears throat> because, because we've got lots of data coming from lots of train. Uh, but, but now we've got ways of doing things in the background to, to look at it. So I mentioned, <clears throat> I mentioned APC um, failures. So APC, automatic power control, is how you control the circuit breaker as you go through the neutral sections. So when you go from one supply to the other, usually with the change of phase. Uh, so as you approach the, the neutral section, there's, a, there's some track magnets and there's a receiver on the train. So as you come over the magnet, the receiver on the train detects it's seen an APC magnet and that tells it to open the VCB. As you go out the other side, uh, it goes over a second magnet and that tells it to reclose the VCB. Now there's various things that can go wrong. You can get a fault on the receiver. Um, sometimes somebody will come along and do some tamping on the, on the track and bury one of the magnets. Um, and depending on, on what the fault is, 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 is what the consequences are. If the train opens its VCB at the first magnet and doesn't reclose it, then, then the train's got no power. But after 15 seconds, we have a message that flashes up to the driver says the train's not reset. So you need to press, press your reset button and that'll reclose the circuit breaker. If the trains fail to open the VCB at the first magnet, then you still draw current when you reach the neutral section. And at that stage, you draw an arc across the neutral section. And that arc can cause damage to the overhead line equipment, um, which, which may not immediately cause a problem, but if you get a few events, <clears throat> you can end up with the OLE equipment becoming a lot stiffer and not operating properly and eventually failing. And if you get a failure to neutral section, that can be catastrophic. Um, so one of the things we wanted to try to do is, is can, we, can we work out if, if it's failed, if the APCs failed to operate at the first magnet or the second magnet? And now we, we, had, we have history of, of, the, of such events. You know, we've had, we do have APC receiver faults 
where they've been struck with equipment, uh, typically in, in, in bad weather. Um, and what we actually saw is that if you get the art in, uh, you do tend to get certain faults in the traction system. Right. And the fault you usually get is the 83 hertz fault, which we put all this equipment in for back in 2000. They've never really been used for very much. Um, and, and because you get, a, you get a very high DI by DT, you get a very fast rate of change. So, in, and so there is a, a significant 83 hertz component in that. So that, so that, can, that can trigger uh, the 83 hertz fault. So an 83 hertz fault can be an indication of, of arcing at the overhead line. Uh, and, and there's also other faults. Sometimes you can get a secondary overcurrent because the line voltage disappears and the, the, the converter is still trying to run. Uh, so that allows us to start putting some intelligence into, into what the failure modes may be. Um, and this is sort of looking over that how many APC not reset events we've had in the last week. And I think, I think here there's been five trains, six trains affected, five trains. Um, but these are, these are just single one-off events. Um, you can have two types of event. If, it, if it's a magnet fault, every train will pick up that magnet fault. So if you get multiple trains picking up a fault at the same location, you know it's an infrastructure problem. If you've got a train with an APC receiver fault, then that will cause a, a, a fault at every neutral section. So if you get multiple faults at different locations, you know it's a train fault. And, and the, the rules behind the alerts are set up to identify that. Um, but one odd one that we found is we started to see some spurious APC detections, uh, in particular, uh, just outside Euston, around Camden. Now, this is a section of, of, of railway where you've got DC lines on the local services, 750 volt DC, and you've got the 25 kV tracks alongside them. Uh, <clears throat> so we started to suspect, is, you know, is, is there something going on there with the DC system? Uh, and this was actually taken a few years ago when we had a particular spate of these. And so somebody went out to have a look at what was going on at the track. And we saw <clears throat> these cables, <clears throat> the cables there, are 750 watt DC power supply cables running alongside the rail of the 25 kV uh, railway. So what, what was happening that if you got a train accelerating out of Houston, the DC system, uh, that, that was putting a DC current through those cables. If you've got a pendolino going past with its receiver at the same time, it was generating the field that was causing the pendolino to trigger its APC equipment. So that one was easily fixed because somebody went along one night, identified it and moved the cables further away. Um, but I think we, we still do have some. So I think there are some which are actually buried in the infrastructure, which are, are not quite so easy to address. It doesn't cause too much of an issue because <clears throat> even though it opens the VCB, it's always on trains going into Houston. So they, they just carry on rolling and, uh, and they swap pans anyway when they arrive in Houston. Uh, so th this idea of looking for 83 hertz faults and, and secondary over current faults uh, allowed us to start to put up some other alerts, um, <clears throat> which are used for trying to detect places where you might have an arc detected. So we, we can look for clusters of events. Um, although it looks like there's some quite big clusters here, mostly when as you start to zoom in, those are those are spread out. But there's one particular location where we, we have some significant clusters, and this is at College Junction. So this is where the line from Stoke joins the West Coast Main Line, uh, and, and and this is this is current information data. This is from yesterday. Uh, and, and this is looking at the number of events we've had in the last 30 days, about 134 events there. Now, previously, when we have reported this, uh, we know there's something going on in that area, but, but it's, it's a bit difficult to pinpoint it. Now, what we have now, fortunately, we now have the pantograph cameras. So we can now say, we think we've got a, an arcing problem here. Um, can you reach through the pantograph camera images and, and see what you're getting? And, and, and that's where all the, the data coming from the different sources all gives you the full story. So uh, <clears throat> this is the train approaching There's a series of stills here. And you can see we're starting to get arcing as one of the wires runs off in one direction. And the, the arc getting bigger. And then leaving the flame behind. Not, not, not every train does it, but you get certainly several trains each day that are doing it. So it's a combination of things, speed, um, 
role of the tree. Um, you know, we actually had someone go out and do some intervention there about 18 months ago, which actually eliminated it, but it's come back again. So we don't, we don't know what's happened. Is, is it wear and tear on, on, the, on the OLE equipment or has somebody tamped the track and the track's now in a slightly different position? So we're waiting for somebody to go back and have another look at this. But as soon as someone's been out there and had a look at it, we can immediately tell, you know, are we getting any those faults? To, you know, they looked at it last night. Are we getting any fault events today? And if not, we can tell that they've fixed it. <clears throat> Some of the other issues we've found, um, this is one that's close to hearts of some of the people in this room is, uh, is DC component faults on the Grand Junction lines. Now the Grand Junction line is a line that bypasses Birmingham and that's normally used by freight traffic and, and commuter services. But every now and then Pendolinos go that way on, on diversion running. Uh, and, and most of the time it's okay, but every now and then we get these sudden uh, clusters of, of DC component faults. So, so we're detecting a DC component in the secondary waveform. And it's between the neutral section at Willen Hall and, and Bescott Stadium. Uh, but it's only on that section of line. So uh, what we started to look at was the feeding arrangements. Uh, normally, uh, Willen Hall feeds as far as, as Perry Bar. Uh, and then the, the, the subsequent sections fed from Aston, Aston I think it is. Um, but but there's, a, there's another issue in that Woolen Hall is, is not a very high capacity feeder station. So when you suddenly start sending pendolinos over there in numbers, uh, it, it, it can end up shutting down with a thermal trip. And once it shuts down in the thermal trip, that one shuts down and, and the other section feeds in over a much longer distance. And that's the condition where we start to get the DC fault. Um, so we, we, we come to understand why with this different feeding range, we should get DC faults. Uh, so we, we network rail went out and instrumented the one of the feeder stations at Bescott, I think it was at Bescott. Bescott. Yeah, and, and, the, and these are some of the waveforms. So this is a typical waveform with a class 390. You can see the harmonics around about three, four kilohertz where you normally expect to see them and everything looks good. Uh, this waveform is when you've gone into the alternative feed arrangement. But this isn't a class 390, this is actually the, the, the characteristics of the harmonics, not a class 390 characteristics. And what we actually found it was, it was class 323 trains working on the cross city lines, running to Litchfield, that were in, inducing harmonics into the supply. Some sort of resonance issue that was then interacting with the pendolinos and causing DC component. So, uh, that was one which was a good find, I think, when we got there. And, uh, and, and it was actually been addressed by reducing the length of the section that's fed from Woolen Hall. So Woolen Hall is now less likely to trip out on a thermal overload. So we never get into the situation where we've got the alternative feed in and, and the class 323s are due to be replaced in the next couple of years anyway. I mean, class 323s run alongside class 390s in the Northwest ever since they were introduced and we've had no issues, but they seem to be a particular something particularly strange about this location. Um, the final one I've got is, is where we find clusters of events between Winsford and Crewe. And these are normally towards the Crewe end. Uh, the, the line is fed from, from the north from Weaver Junction. Uh, and, and we get all sorts of events on the ground towards Crewe. Then we put instrumentation in here, but this wasn't quite, quite as good. Uh, what we actually found was it was a combination of how many trains, pendolino trains were in the system. Uh, and the way the timetable was, you can end up with two pendolinos accelerating at the same time as there's another train coming down, heading into crew, regenerating. And the line impedance on this particular section of the line is quite high. So you end up remote from the substation with a high line impedance, some trains drawing power, some trains regenerating power, and you start to get interactions between the two and with the supply system as well. Um, so we've not really got a fix for that one until somebody starts to, there were plan. this should all have been upgraded as part of the West Coast upgrade, but the, the power supply upgrade, but the money ran out. So I think that's now not due to be upgraded until HS2 arrives. Um, generally, it doesn't cause, it, 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 every now and then we'll get a lockout of traction equipment, but it's, at least now we, we understand what, what the cause is and what we can, we can, we can action it. Um, so th this was, 
I mean, it's interesting to see this, the way this group developed over the last three years. I think when we first started, we didn't think we'd get very much from the train in terms of helping the infrastructure. Um, but, but we found a lot more than we, yeah, what we anticipated. Mm. The other thing is, is that we start to pull in data from different systems. We, we've got the data from the CCTV. We've also got the PANDAS, which is monitoring for, for impact events on the OLE. And we've got the ARC detection from, from the train fault logs. You pull them all together, you can start to identify where you've got genuine problems. Um, the, the, the tricky bit now is we're trying to automate the alerts um, because some of this requires myself to go and analyze the data to, to understand what's going on. So uh, we, we need to sort of set the alerts to, to trigger automatically. Um, but what you don't want to do is to start triggering false alarms and people going out investigating things on the chat where there's not really an issue. Um, so you need to maintain the confidence in the system. So that's it. That's been 20 years of pendolinos in. <laughs> Thanks, John. That's uh, yeah, a thoroughly interesting uh, lecture. How long was the overall development program? Um, I mean, we started in 1998. The first train. We started in 1998 and the first train was running on the test track in 2001. Um, first train into service in 2002, so four years. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think what we'll do, we'll, we'll take questions from the room first. Um, and if, yeah, if, if you just want to raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over. <laughs> Howard Parkinson. Um, do we run many trains in this country with two pantographs up? not at high speed uh, I, I think we are starting to do more now um, yeah. because there's been developments in pantograph design um, there so was a chap at this conference uh, from Japan and the, I know that they run their uh, Shinkansei with, yeah. with both up yeah um, and, and certainly see the TGVs I think in France when we both up but I think they have a high attention in the old red line uh -huh. uh, I mean we did some sets at one time with two uh, pendolinos in multiple with two nine cars in multiple, and um, we're okay up to about uh, 110 miles an hour. Up beyond 110 miles an hour, the trailing, the, the, the second pendolino was starting to see reduction in performance. So you think higher tension in the, in the contact wire might help? It, it does, and I, and I think that on Great Western, where they run uh, the five car Hitachi trains in, in multiple, with so each one's got its own pantograph up, that, that's all been designed for high tension um, to, to support that. And it's also got an improved design of panty there. Thank you. Um, anyone else? A technical question. I just wondered in terms, I don't need to. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> I was like, just were there any tests done on the passengers as to what with the tilt and when the tilt was introduced to see whether there was any kind of effect, psychological effect or or sort of a balancing effect with with regard to passengers. It was history from APT uh, mm -hmm. when when APT ran. I think uh, APT gave perfect compensation for, for tilt. Yeah, and and there was there was problems with passengers feeling queasy because they could see the yeah. horizon going up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't feel anything. Now yeah. on Pendolino, I think it's I think we do eighty percent compensation, so you still feel some some movement in, in internally, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's that's been a, a big help. I think we, we, very few people seem to to query it, but then some people do. It happens to them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people are more susceptible. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm sure you. some people will complain about it when they're not tilting as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyone else? No? I've just got one before we go. To, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So um, regarding the different ele electrification systems, is there any particular electrification system that gives worst harmonics? If you go over like classic railroad tra booster or rating? Obviously down to impedance mapping. I think. I, I think what's happening now is, is we used to have the uh, people started to take out the booster transformers, which were part of the, which increased the impedance of the system, and they they generate some of the the resonances. Uh, so I think as part of the East Coast upgrade, they're taking out booster transformers that have been put in previously for other reasons, but they now seem to be more of a, an issue than they were a benefit. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, we've got some um, questions on the chat and the question and answer from the online people. So there's one from Jonathan. How similar is the 390 traction package to the 334s? We in NR Scotland, so I assume that's Northern Rail Scotland, have been having harmonics issues around 750, 1500 hertz with six car 334 sets causing spurious trips under regen until a harmonic damp was put into circuit. They are, they are very similar. They, they operate at the same frequencies. Um, the difference there is there's, there's two traction, there's two four quadrant converters interlaced. Um, so so it's, it's a smaller train. Yeah, I, I'm actually involved with the class 334 project as well. So, so if you want to contact me with the, with the details, um, I'd be happy to, to try and have a look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, there was an anonymous attendee to ask this question. If the class 390 were to be redesigned today, what would be the major differences stemming from advances in technology and return of experience? <clears throat> I mean, there's been a, a development in standards. Um, there's, there's new standards in the that have been introduced into Europe that the trains would now have to be built to. Um, I think that's one of the major changes, um, which I think. I mean, a, a lot, a lot of the electronic systems are now no longer available, and 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 now there are <clears throat> there are systems in the control that can do third and fifth harmonic rejection. Um, which helps when you get mixed types of fleets running together. Um, so, so there's there's enhancements there. Uh, but I think generally, it, it, you know, it, it's been pretty good. I mean, it, it was always designed to, to whatever went wrong, you should be able to recover yourself. And I, and I think that it's managed to to do that very well. I mean, to, to the extent that, that Virgin got rid of their rescue locals because they never got used. Okay. Thank you. That was actually from Jonathan. I got it wrong when I read it. The anonymous attendees question is this one. If Alston were to design a Mark II CL390, what changes, other than those driven by standards revisions, would be incorporated? For example, you might look at bringing down per seat mass or having higher installed power. Yeah, power is limited by, by the, the system anyway, by the supply. I think one one thing I, I, we've looked over the years at different length pendolinos. We looked at six car, we looked at five car. I mean, I I saw the ideal design as being a, a five car train with one transformer, with four secondaries and four traction packages, because the the, the more molded axles you get, the the more regen braking you can do, and more consistent performance. Um, so so the, 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 there are things we we, we looked at. Um, but again, you're also limited by the size of transform you can get on the underframe you know, with the space available. Um, but the, 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 yeah, the, there's been several attempts over the years to, to, to come up with a, an improved version. Unfortunately, we've, we've never had a project in which to, to develop it. Okay, we just got three questions and then we're there. So from Per Anderson, if I understand right, axial counters using AC in most countries, but Sweden use DC. Why is that? I don't know. I, I thought axle counter standard was was around thirty kilohertz, or I think there's some now that was just sixty five kilohertz. Um, it may, maybe it's a misinterpretation of terms, perhaps. Okay. Uh, another question from Jonathan: Could overhead line resonance be addressed by switching between different operating frequencies, or is this just too difficult to manage? I, send, I think it is, it's difficult to manage. Um, <clears throat> Because you have to predict what's going to happen next, and and it's a complex system as well because there's multiple trains running around the network, so you've got lots of, of moving loads. Um, but uh, we do have a much better understanding of it now, and 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 the control of it is 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 much better. I mean, if we can reduce the harmonics on the train, clearly that's that's a great benefit. You know, and, and and some of the ways that we did the original interlacing, and nowadays with a modern system, you you could do more precise interlacing. The more precise it is, the better cancellation you get. You know, so so there are things that that, that could be done. Okay, thank you. There's one from webinar chat. This may be an understandable question. It may be out of context. Was there a decision to increase the length of the carriages, and did this affect the validation? I don't think the carriage lengths were were increased. 
I can't remember. I think it was, it must have been in the very early days. Um, <clears throat> I know the, the IEP trains are, are, are much longer carriages, but the Pendolinos are about 24 meters, I think they are. Okay, um, that's great. Thank you. Martin. Okay, um, thank you, John. That, that's brilliant. Um, so I think that uh, brings our session to a close. Um, apologies for the uh, delay initially. Uh, as I say, it's the first time we've actually uh, done a hybrid event in Austin Court and um, on Zoom. But uh, yeah, a few teething troubles hopefully uh, won't be repeated in the future. Thank you very much.